The restoration of Fokker Super Universal CFAAM was a 17-year journey realized through the dedication of a small team of engineers and craftspeople, namely Clark Seaborn, Don McLean, Ron Jackson, and Ross Richardson. But with an aircraft this rare, a proper restoration would have been impossible without a lot of help from the historical aviation community. Mike Pirro led a team into the wreck of Super Universal CASL to recover vital components. Ross Richardson supplied copies of original blueprints and pattern plans from factory originals. And an aircraft restorer in the United States pointed Seaborn to the remains of the last U.S. registered Super Universal in Boise, Idaho, which had been lost to fire in 1960. A trip down to the site yielded a usable steel tube elevator. However, one crucial component continued to elude them, the instrument panel. Prior to the standardization of cockpit instruments in 1929, it was not uncommon to have a wide variety of control panel configurations, all using World War I surplus instruments. Although interviews with former Fokker pilots provided some insight as to the overall layout, no plans had been discovered up to that point. Word spread of Seaborn search and, miraculously, a complete instrument panel emerged from a private collection. The only original known to exist today, this panel had been recovered from a wreck that had previously been flown by famed bush pilot Punch Dickens and other Western Canada Airways pilots. The owner contacted Seaborn and arrangements were made to take the appropriate measurements. A new panel was fabricated to original specifications and installed. The AAM project owed its success to the support of the aviation community who came together to put the last Fokker Super Universal back in the sky. In 1986, Clark Seaborn and his team began work on one of the most daunting steps of the entire restoration, that of recreating from scratch the massive one-piece wing. At 51 feet long, this was to be one of the most challenging wooden wing constructions ever attempted by amateur woodworkers. Of the various Fokker wrecks and artifacts that had been recovered, not one of them had included a complete wing example. Instead, Seaborn relied on recently discovered blueprints, hand-traced copies, and historical photographs for reference. The uh, Canadian Vickers plant in Montreal, about 1929, and there's, there's a lot of detail in here that help a, a restorer to, to make a, an airplane. It tells them how the workers were able to work on top of the wing, um, how they were, the, the order that they applied the sheets to the wing, and um, many valuable stories evident in that. But one partial artifact provided at least a glimpse of the wing's inner workings. An artifact very familiar to AAM. Following the fateful final takeoff attempt in Dawson City, Yukon, the undamaged wing, which had been overhauled following the earlier incident at Francis Lake, was removed from AAM, loaded on a river barge, shipped upriver, and installed on Fokker sister ship AJC. In 1942, AJC was attempting a takeoff from the Desdiash River, approximately 80 kilometers west of Whitehorse, when its wing clipped a tree and it creened into the bush. Some details of this event had been discovered in the government files, which led to identifying the pilot. In 1985, Seaborn and Bob Cameron ventured into the area to investigate. Northern Airways crews had retrieved the fuselage and engine, but determined that the wing was damaged beyond repair. Although much of the remains had been long since lost to the elements, portions of the main spar were found intact and recovered. They showed lamination patterns and splices not found earlier. The original 58-year-old wing of AAM hangs on the, on the wall of the shop as a constant source of information on laminations and ply thicknesses. 
this was used throughout the project in addition to the drawings which came from the old Fokker files. The scarf patterns have now become unglued, but they're still good evidence of how the wing was, was constructed. The next step was to source a wood supply sufficient to build the new wing. Large quantities of Sitka spruce, 4 inches wide by 3 eighths inches thick, were needed for the wing spar laminations, as well as a large quantity of 5 sixteenths by 1 half inch stringers, amongst other sizes. Wood had not been a major component in aircraft design since the de Havilland Mosquito and Avro Ansons of World War II. As such, the necessary supply would have to come from a boutique vendor at premium prices. Fortunately, a supplier, Neil Davidson, was found in British Columbia. He had recently harvested a massive Sitka spruce tree in the BC rainforest after several weeks of hard and perilous work. Davidson put together a custom order, especially cut and planed for the project. It arrived in Calgary at the new workspace that Seaborn had rented for this restoration. A large quantity of plywood was also needed to fabricate the wing ribs and cladding. Exact measurements were needed to minimize the amount of wood wasted when cutting each component. At this time, a local mechanic and carpenter, Ron Jackson, came on board. He and Seaborn secured the loan of a steel beam form that allowed them to build a perfectly level 52-foot-long table that stretched the entire length of the workplace. This was to be the base from which the spars could be properly aligned and clamped. Spars have been tapered in both directions. They're then placed in the jig and clamped to the outside forms, thus leaving the uh, the outside shape of the finished spar. It's then prepared to put the uh, plywood web members between the uh, caps. Comes the lengthy chore of gluing the verticals in place. With the internal spar structure complete, the spars were sealed, covered, and planed. By 1988, Jackson and Seaborn had completed the two wing spars, with the heavier of the two weighing in at 200 pounds. The spars were trailered to Seaborn's home and trial fitted to the fuselage. Now they were ready for the wing assembly itself. In the shop, set on the trestle upside down, leveled using a survey level, and the process of installing ribs was begun. This is the shape uh, for the center ribs. It's been traced on the tracing paper, and we'll use this to obtain the airflow shape for the center ribs. You see where the pencil is marked under the tracing paper. Now, in order to get a nice smooth line, we're going to use a little piece of cap strip as a spline. Use your knees, fingers, whatever we have to get the best curve. It takes about an hour rip to do these. Ah, the holes for the stringers are made. A homemade hole punch. There's about 400 holes in all the ribs. It seemed like it was easier to make a machine to do this than to do them all with the drill and fire. The various size lightning holes are uh, traced out with the plywood. Having a bypassing U router jig like this allows us to change the size of the holes with the varying tapers of the wing. Hole. A list to, uh, to take about 10 pounds of wood off of 40 ribs. Layout on the second rib is much easier than the first, it's just simply traced from the first. At this point, the cap strips are glued onto the uh, ply ribs. 
one piece goes on one side of the plywood, the other piece goes on the other side. Next the vertical stiffeners are added. And so the wing is starting to take shape. The nose ribs each represents about three hours of work, getting all the tight curves that are required. We start out with a nose rib at station one with a curvature like that. And we end up at station 16 at the wingtip with a very tight curvature like that. Each one of these cap strips is laminated from two pieces of ash. Now, the way you're doing that, of course, is to uh, steam the ash until uh, for an hour and a half until it's uh, very pliable. Uh, we've made a tall narrow cauldron that uh, takes a couple of quarts of water and it's heated with a propane torch fueled with a hundred pound uh, bottle of propane and a whole number of rib cap strips can be fitted into this. And then bend the pieces of ash in a form and hold them in a form or until they're dry and then bent in a tight curve. Wood stringers are another fun thing. They're pieces of spruce, one quarter inch by seven sixteenths of an inch. They have to be fitted in the lines in the holes that have been punched in each rib and hopefully they're in a straight line. it's run through to the full extent of this piece of stringer. We eyeball down the line to see if it's straight. Then we mark with a pencil the position of the rib. Because the stringer has to be notched to bring it out flush to the surface of the skin of the wing. The uh, position of each rib that's been marked is then cut and the back off. After these the stringer is fitted, then it has to be backed up with a little reinforcing block. And, uh, they're simply glued on the back, or a taper block glued on the back to hold the uh, stringer flush to the back of the sheet line. No nailing required. Doesn't that get boring after a while to do all that? The next several months were spent readying the wing structure for total enclosure. This is the neat little device that Ernie Favreau, a former Starrett mechanic, told me about. This is a wheel that looks like a pizza cutter with uh, pointed little nails situated three quarters of an inch on center. And it's used to put pin pricks in the uh, covering material to ensure that we get nail spacings exactly correct and neat and tidy looking. Hidden radio antennas were installed. The interior structure was varnished for protection against moisture. Control surfaces were cut from the wing and installed. There it is. And numerous aileron fittings were fastened into place. A second trial fitting took place in September of 1992. With the wing sufficiently stiff of torsion, it could be lifted from the table and trial fit to the fuselage. This time the fuselage was trailered to the shop in Calgary. A team of four worked nine hours to extract the partially complete wing from the workspace and install it and the assembled tailplanes on the fuselage. 
For photo purposes, another component was test fitted, the Pratt and Whitney Wasp engine. Although the new engine was built in 1943, Jean Schweitzer, a Montreal resident who had been a longtime employee of Pratt and Whitney, had the experience and expertise to help the team operate it like its 1929 counterpart. This meant, among other things, overseeing the engine installation, removing the prop governor, and replacing the more modern constant speed propeller with a vintage ground adjustable one. Calgarian sheet metal expert Bob Miller, who had previously built two metal airplanes and a replica vintage car, assisted in the fabrication of the exhaust collector manifold and associated cowling parts. Ontario resident Don Sterrett crafted a set of laser-cut hinges based on the original example and shipped them to the team in Calgary. Aircraft maintenance engineer Don McLean came on board the project in late 1992 and lent his calm demeanor, extensive technical expertise, and aviation industry knowledge to the restoration. The fuel tanks were the next crucial wing component to be tackled. Two original tanks had been acquired, one of which was a very early model brass sheet tank with riveted and lead solder joints. This particular tank is believed to have come from AAM, having been painted in Northern Airways yellow and green, complete with a visible section of the registration lettering on the top panel as well as dents and scratches from the mechanic's winter boots. A pressure test determined that there were 20 leaks along the seams, which were then repaired using the same low-tech soldering techniques as used in the 1930s. For safety purposes, the tanks were filled with carbon dioxide from a CO2 fire extinguisher prior to heating. On April Fool's Day, 1993, the final nail was tapped into place. The team marked this occasion by recalling the driving of the last spike on the Canadian Pacific Railway. Time overruns and the required prep work had pushed the painting process from an anticipated summer target into the fall. And on October 10, 1993, painting began. Another hurdle had to be cleared. The acquisition of AAM's official registration. Following its final flight in 1937, AAM's registration letters had been cancelled. Some time later, a DC-3 operated in Ontario, and later in Smithers, BC, picked up the registration letters. The restoration team contacted the new AAM's owners, and arrangements were made, pending DOT approval, to switch the registration back to the Fokker Super Universal. On January 13, 1993, the DC-3 AAM was flying out of a mining airstrip in the Stikine River area when it crashed shortly after takeoff. Both crew members were killed and the aircraft destroyed. The CFAAM registration was once again available, but in the most heartbreaking way possible. In January of 1994, Seaborn learned that the private airstrip that he had been working from had been shut down, so he leased space at the Indus Airport southeast of Calgary and moved his metal hangar from its previous location onto this new property. The rebuilt hangar featured an extended end frame to accommodate the Fokker's 51-foot wing. Most of 1994 was taken up with dismantling, moving, and reassembling the salvaged hangar. The restoration was nearing its final stretch. The fabric covering was installed on AAM's fuselage and tailplanes. Staying authentic to the 1929 standards, the team used cotton fabric, tapes, and butyrate dopes. Pulls it up tight in a hurry, doesn't it? Using an industrial sewing machine, the fabric was sewn into covering bags, exactly like it had been at the Fokker factory. To achieve better access to the underside of the fuselage, the team built a rotisserie and used it throughout the covering and painting stages. The cotton fabric bags were fitted onto the fuselage, shrunk, and then painstakingly sewn into place. So now Don's done this good work, now he has to climb out of the belly. Before being painted in authentic Northern Airways colors, complete with registration and markings. 
Other activities during this time included the acquisition, repair, and installation of the authentic cockpit instruments. A vintage Pioneer compass that miraculously had not been thrown out in 70 years was donated to the project. Carl Gill, who had been a Cominco pilot in the north, had died in a 1930 crash while on an RCAF flying course at Camp Borden. He had evidently sent a rare Pioneer rear-reading cabin compass to his mother living in Cranbrook, B.C. The artifact was discovered by his son, who hand-delivered it to the project. Based on Pratt & Whitney expert Gene Schweitzer's recommendation, and to facilitate safe operation in modern airspace, a special subset of gauges was installed. These included manifold pressure, carburetor air temperature, and cylinder head temperature gauges, as well as a supplementary tachometer. In the spring of 1997, the fuselage was trailered from Calgary to the Indus Airport, where the tailplanes were installed and the control cables hooked up and aligned. A few days later, the big wing arrived. After the wing was installed, the fuselage was lifted to allow the vertical undercarriage to be connected. The mighty Pratt & Whitney engine was raised into position. Followed by the finishing touch, the Hamilton Standard ground adjustable propeller. It had been 60 years since AAM's final flight, and although its next flight was still months away, AAM was back. All it needed to fly again was permission. <laughs>